In this episode of The Creator Experience, we are joined by Jamie Taylor. Now, Jamie is a man of many talents. He is a father, a mentor, an educator, a software developer, and a content creator. And Jamie started creating content with one goal in mind, to help as many people practically learn and grow as a developer. His Niche.net core podcast has achieved over 400,000 downloads, with industry peers asking to be part of it, including those from Microsoft. Jamie started in 2016 with blogs, but they escalated to the point it was overwhelming, delivering 3,000 word articles with source code attached every week. So after two years and on a suggestion from some friends, Jamie decided to make the more efficient choice and starting a podcast, starting with repurposing his existing blogs. Now, Jamie loves that feeling of making knowledge happen. And he loves that eureka moment that people have when they're learning something for the first time. And he's built his platforms to reflect that. This is a great episode, and Jamie is very open and incredibly detailed, as you might expect from someone that loves to be a mentor. In this episode, we discuss the importance of building a podcast with a strong purpose and knowing your why. We talk about how to create spaces to help newcomers and those that might not be comfortable with raising their hand to ask the questions. We talk about how to simplify and share valuable knowledge through your content, and how to build a guest review process and still meet deadlines. I love this episode. There's loads in it. It's a long one. I hope you enjoy the show. Jamie, thank you so much for joining me today. I hope you're well. Yeah, I'm very well. Thank you. Thank you for having me on the show. I hope you're all doing well too. And I hope everyone listening is having a fantastic day. Yeah, awesome. I'm great. Thank you. Let's jump straight into it. And can you introduce a little bit about yourself and your podcast, please? Sure, yeah. So I'm I'm Jamie Taylor. I am now let me get this right. I am a dad, a mentor, a programmer, a podcaster, a business owner, a content creator, a whole bunch of stuff. Um not particularly good at any of them, but you know, <laughs> we live and learn. That's the important thing. Um I've been uh been working as a software developer for around 13, 14 years. I've uh, been creating content around sort of development and and helping people get started on their journey in development for I would say around six or seven years. Uh, and that's been blog posts, it's been videos, it's been podcasts, it's been whatever, however I can get that um out. That, that's that's the mode that I've used. I've done talks, I've done mentorships, I've done... I'm currently working with a, uh, a college that's near me in yeah. my area um, to help some of their students get a, a better understanding of what they're learning. Uh, that's not to me- that's not meant to... That's not meant to be me making fun of their teachers and tutors. It's just like, hey, this is someone in industry who has some extra knowledge that maybe you don't have time to go into in the classroom. Let's talk about this, that kind of thing. So I'm all about helping people get started, getting them on that, those first few rungs of development. Because it's difficult. It's not easy. Yeah. Yeah. It's that sort of field experience. And you said you've done six years of content creation. You've been doing blogs and videos and podcasts. Can you tell me, sort of describe that journey to the point that you realized, I now want to make a podcast? Sure. Um, So it started with, uh, so one of the things that I do is I do a lot of uh, stuff with .NET and that's a Microsoft now open source cross-platform stuff for making applications and making uh, websites, making uh, stuff for your smartwatch, stuff for your fridge, if you'll believe it. Okay. Um, uh, You know, that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, And... Uh, I started writing about that back in oh, 2016 because uh, there was like a new version on the horizon. I was like, right, if I'm going to start doing it, I may as well do it when the new version comes out. Yep. So I started writing about my journey of, because before then it was for Windows only. Um, and I'm a bit of a Linux and a Mac OS user. So it was like, hey, at home, I can continue to do my programming without having to buy a Windows machine. There's yeah. nothing wrong with a Windows machine. It's just I already have these other boxes. I may as well use those. And so, um, so I st- so I was like, right, I'll download the latest uh, pre-release version. Start writing about my journey mm-hmm. with it, um, and I carried that on one blog post a week, 
Um, and they got up to around 3,000 words each with a bunch of source code to go with it. And it's like, let's wow. dissect this code and talk about it. Um, did that for about two years and uh, got to the point where I was... I was like on the train into work with the laptop going, if I don't get this sorted now, it's not going to go out. It goes out at midday today. I've got that hard deadline. It has to go out at midday. Must get it released. And I'm, I'm, I'm arguing my, with myself over a single word, right? <laughs> and this, this is things that like professional journalists and authors do. I'm not a professional journalist or a professional author. So that's, that, that went straight out the window. I was like, okay, right, this is the last one I'm doing. I'll figure out another way of, of, of doing stuff. And then I got chatting to some of my friends who were also content creators in that sort of programming space. Mm. And they were like, dude, you know that there aren't any podcasts about this .NET technology, right? And I was like, really? That, that seems like an untapped market. Yeah. And so what I did was I took the first five or six um, uh, blog posts and repurposed them as, as sort of intro to the show podcast. Nice. What is .NET? Let's talk about this. Let's go through a glossary of terms and see if I can glue things together. How did we get to where we are today with .NET? Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the history and things like that. And then I started, I found it so much easier to um, to write almost like a script and monologue it mm. uh, because then I wasn't arguing with myself over words. If I found that the sentence didn't work, I'd change it in my head, re-record the line, and then I'd go back and fix the transcript later, you know? Um, yeah, awesome. So that was easy. I could I could almost like say it out loud. And that seems to be easier for me than sort of sitting at a keyboard and typing and going, is it an an, is it an a, I don't know, <laughs> you know, all that kind of stuff. And then don't get me started on commas and semicolons because I haven't got it. <laughs> um, <laughs> and then... And then the word got out and uh, a bunch of people started going, hey, can I come on your show and talk about this thing? And, you know, we've got this technology coming out or uh, people from Microsoft were reaching out saying, hey, you know, this is really cool. Let's talk about it. Um, and, uh, and as of recording this episode with yourselves, uh, with yourself, so let me try that again. And <laughs> as of recording this episode with yourself, um, last night I recorded episode 99, which will be going out in late May 2022. So we're, we're cresting 100 episodes. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I hate stats, but, you know, if people are interested, it's a pretty, it's a very small niche of the world. Yeah. But after four years, almost 100 episodes, 400,000 lifetime downloads, which is just, it's mental to me, right? I'm not doing it for the numbers. No. I'm doing it to get this information out, right? Yeah, yeah. And that's that. That's where I've sort of gotten to. And, and what I sometimes do as well is I do like live streaming of me writing code, mm -hmm. which when you say it sounds really boring. You're like, what? So you, someone's just going to watch you typing on the keyboard, writing some apps. What's that all about? Yeah. But what, what a lot of people do and what I do is I put a camera in the corner. Most of the screen is the area that I'm typing in, and I'm talking out loud, the talking through the process of writing the app. Yeah. And then there's like a chat window. People can ask questions They're like, "Oh, why are you doing it this way?" Right. Let's just pause what I'm doing, and we'll talk about what this is, or like why I'm doing it this way, or um, what this. You know, somebody will jump in and say, "Oh, what's what's uh, what's modulo, right? So that's what, what we programmers call the percentage sign. So if you do two numbers with a modulo in between them, what it will do is it will do integer division. So it will do, it'll convert them to halt to, to integers, which is numbers without a decimal or a fraction, mm -hmm. divide one by the other and tell you if there's a remainder. And that could be really good for if you're doing like, uh, is this number a multiple of three? Or right. is this number a multiple of five? Really cheap, easy way to do that with, with only like one operation. Otherwise, you've got to do loads of other stuff hmm. so then we go into a, a conversation about that oh cool well we'll talk about this we'll talk about that um and i found it a great way to sort of get that information out there to these people who are either they're either seasoned pros and have never never seen this uh thing before or to the brand new folks who come in and say hey where do i get started well i'll tell you what let's pretend i'm brand new to this i'll yeah. go through this journey with you and let's see if we could together can figure out how to get started and uh, I th it's 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 been wonderful so far. Just like being able to reach out to these people and say, "Hey, let's get you started on this journey." You don't have to have a degree. You don't have to go to school. You don't have to go to a, a book. Uh, so let me try those three again. You don't have to get a degree. You don't have to go to school. You don't have to get to a boot camp or anything like that. Just have a look and see. Get someone who can help you out, and that's what I'm trying to do, right? Yeah. 
I mean, that's a huge body of work and it's fantastic that you've kind of gone through that evolution almost as new media has from blogs to audio to video and then back around to live streams. I think more importantly here is that I get the the that you want to help people, but why do you want to help people? Why is this so important to you to add the the layer of education that you feel people aren't getting? So I guess it, it comes back to, uh, so I did, uh, at university, I did computer science, mm -hmm. graduated in 2008, and you know anyone who knows much about financial history around the 2007 to 2009 era will know that like the great big credit crunch horribleness happened. A bit right? rocky, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it wasn't great. <laughs> <laughs> and so where I was living at the time, uh, which is on the east coast of the UK, there were absolutely no programming jobs. Sure. And so what I thought was, um, I got out of uni and I was like, I want to go into teaching. Uh, it had been a dream of mine to go to Japan and teach English out there. Okay. Because I'd spent I'd spent part of my degree learning Japanese and I got wow. well into the culture and the history and stuff like that. Yeah. And I have actually been out a couple of times since then. I'll happily share some photos if folks are interested in seeing them for the show notes or whatever. Mm. Um, and so my goal was... I go out to Japan. I applied for a thing called the JET, which is like a Japanese exchange teaching program. Mm -hmm. um, got all the way through to the finals and didn't get in because uh, they only let 10 people in that year. Oh. Bit of a shame, but whatever. Yeah. And then I've, I saw this um, uh, this ad for, and it was in the newspaper of all things, right? So we were just talking about new media. I'm talking about old yeah. media. Right? <laughs> in the physical newspaper, it was like, wanted. People who want to learn to be a teacher, take your, you know, your... Uh, whatever it was, PGCE with us and learn to be a teacher. Yeah. And I applied for this school and they were like, yep, cool, come on in. We'll get you working on that. You can be teaching the, uh, and so this was a secondary school teaching mathematics. Mm -hmm. And I got bitten. I got bitten by that. There's something, I'm sure you've seen it yourself, Matt, and I'm sure the listeners have as well. When you're teaching someone, when you're in making knowledge happen to them. That's what my friend Zach says, not imparting knowledge on them, making knowledge happen to them. When they yeah. go, oh, wow. And Those they just eureka get moments. It. Yeah, right? Yeah. And it just, it, it gives me a buzz just to hear someone go, I didn't understand it before, I get it now. And it's not it's nothing to do with me. It's all about how they've internalized it. Yeah, I've sort of supported them, but they've done the hard work of figuring it out. And that eureka moment just gives me a buzz. And so my thing since then, uh, I mean, I did get into, I did get a job doing programming about 12 to 18 months after starting that PGC pro process. Mm. Um, did get, I started my career proper after that point. But all the way through it, I've been like, right, okay, there's some people in the room who are more junior than me, even though I am I only have like two years of experience. Yeah. They are brand new. They have loads of questions. I will happily spend 20 minutes, half an hour, an hour talking to them to help them sort of get over this 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 uh, this sort of hump of this gap in their knowledge yeah. because I've been in that position myself and it's horrible, right? For some people, like uh, people like to joke that um, – Developers are either introverts, uh, rather extreme introverts or extreme extroverts. Right. And a lot of the people that I've met on my journey have been introverts. And so being in a room full of people and feeling like you don't know what they're talking about and being an introvert and all of that adds up to you not wanting to ask yeah. because you're worried, oh, well, if, if, if I pretend that I... It's, it's the, have you ever seen Friends? It's the bit in Friends mm. where Joey's sitting around and everyone's talking about stuff and he does not know what they're talking about and he gets fooled into buying a bunch of um, encyclopedias. Yeah. Because he doesn't understand the conversation. Same thing. When you're right at the beginning of your development journey, you may not understand the conversation. You may not be brave enough to say, actually, what is that? And so I'll go over to people and I'll be like, hey, you know, let's talk about this. You know, yeah. if you're not if you're not happy saying it to the group, totally come over and talk to me. That's not a problem. And I'm um, I'm all about sort of sharing whatever knowledge I have. And if I get a question that I don't know the answer to, I'm like, you know what? I don't know either. Let's find out together, because then yeah. I'll know too, you know? I think you and I share a lot of the same sentiments there. I, <laughs> I love helping people and uh, everyone's starting to learn something. There's that quote isn't there you don't have to be great to start but you have to start to be great and I've always liked that That's like there's someone they don't they don't want to stay where they are nobody wants to stay where they are I mean, maybe some people but that positive mindset that growth mindset and demonstrating through actions as well just helps people learn and connect with you so much more
Which brings me on to the next question, really, which is, did you identify who your people were before you started creating content? Did you have sort of an avatar in mind or was it just whoever picks this up? I think it's kind of important to do that, right? Um, mm. I was talking to some folks uh, earlier today and they were saying, how, how do I market my content? And I said to them, why are you making it? Tell me your why first. Don't, don't tell me the content you're making. Mm. Why are you making it? Once you've figured out your why, there's this great book by uh, Simon Sinek. Uh, I'm not sure I'm pronouncing his name correctly yeah. there, but it's called um, Start With Why. And yeah. it is all about figure out your why first and then work up from there. And I, I would say figure out your why, then figure out the who. Because otherwise you're shouting into the void, right? Yeah. If all you're doing is saying, I've written a blog post, 10 best ways to make butternut squash or whatever. Yeah, well, clickbaity. Who's yeah, right. Who, who's it? Who's it for? Yeah. Is it for you? Fantastic. Is it for people who don't know how to make butternut squash meals? Mm. Brilliant. You know. But if it is like you say, just clickbaity, then you know, unless you are incredibly lucky to be in that tiny niche of people who write content about butternut squash, yeah, you're not going to get a huge audience, right? You need to know the audience. If you if you talk to a musician, I'm sure that if you talk to a musician, especially with pop music, mm. they'd be like, "Yep." I know exactly who wants to listen to this song. My song is about, and it is for, you know? Yeah. The, like uh, Taylor Swift, right? She gets a load of flack for being, oh, well, I'll write a song because I've met a, new, met a new person, and then I'll write a song because I've fallen out with him. Well, guess what? She's telling the story of a relationship to people who want to hear the stories of relationships, right? Yeah. She she has identified her audience and she's playing to that. Uh, I'm not trying to to knock her at all. She's an incredibly talented, mm. incredibly skilled musician, really knows what she's doing. But that's like the first example that came to mind, right? And yeah. I'm sure that you could do the same with like Rammstein or Slipknot if you wanted to go <laughs> that direction. They know the audience. They know yeah. that they are they are they're creating music for specific types of metalheads. Yeah. And specific types of like, I don't want to say subgenre, but you know what I mean? Like the, the specific set of people who will want to hear that stuff. And so they will stick with the, with the tropes and the the specific ideas that people will be expecting to hear, yeah. but then innovating on, on top of it. And so I did exactly the same. I sat down. I actually, what I did was I took my MacBook Air, which I still have. So I got this in 2014 and it's still running strong. Took it to my local... Um, totally not sponsored this episode um coffee shop and <laughs> i sat there with you know a caramel latte and i wrote out who is this content for yeah and I, right okay programmer with zero experience of this particular um uh technology or up to two years of experience of sort of footing with it just playing with it um what do, and, and every single one of the monologues that I did, and I've only done monologues for maybe the first 15 episodes, they all started with, what do I want this person to know when they're finished? Mm. Right, And that's how, I, that's how I approach any of the talks that I do, any of the videos I do. Where do I want them to be when I'm done? And work back from that. And then if I know where I want them to be and I know where they are, it's just a case of filling in the middle, right? Yeah. <laughs> and it's 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 like if you know how the sentence starts and you know how the sentence ends, it's just the filler in the middle. That's that bit's easy, right? Yeah. <laughs> Especially from experience as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So you said you started the podcast with monologues and now you've moved into a more interview style show. It's more conversational discussion style. Um, mm -hmm. Was that a conscious move to sort of not have a solo show forever? Did you get lonely? How did the product develop? So that was more a case of, uh, it was kind of organic. Uh, mm. I put out a bunch of these monologues where it's like, hey, beginners, if you want to know about this stuff, I've been doing this for four years or whatever, you know, just in my own time. I've written about it a whole bunch. But here's some stuff, this audio stuff that can get you started. Mm -hmm. And then people started reaching out and saying, this is awesome. Can I talk about this particular tool or this particular technique or this particular thing? And I was like, absolutely, let's talk about nice. this. And, and so out of those 99 episodes that I've released, like I said, or, or rather 99 that are recorded at the time that we're doing this, mm -hmm. there's only 92 uh, released at the minute there's 16 episodes that are just me the rest okay. is me talking to someone else or in the case of three episodes them in you know talking to me where we've turned the tables and they're asking me questions oh, nice. because why not right yeah it's all about yeah, exactly. let's let's get this information out there and and i don't mind 
what format it takes because as long as someone if someone downloads one of the episodes of my show or one of my shows that i'm on and listens to it and learns one thing if they listen for an hour and learn one thing and go right i've got to go to google or bing or yahoo or whatever search engine you're using and type this in oh my goodness i've gone on this journey yeah. that's them like you said it's them starting that journey and i'm all about that right yes yeah. Someone else on the uh, podcast series, this series, uh, said that podcasting is the beginning of a conversation. It's not It's not sort of its own entity. Ideally, you want the podcast to lead to people getting in touch or changing something that they're doing, having an action or even an emotion for some people. And um, yeah, I think that's very true. When it comes to the topics of your podcast... Um, is there, I mean, I kind of guess I know what the answer is here, but is that entirely led by audience interaction or do you sort of jump on topics that you see trending? How do you find the material that you want to discuss? So it, it, it's kind of a, a mixture of both, right? Mm. So um, I've had people reach out on Twitter and say, hey, wouldn't it be great if you did? Uh, so there's a, a technology within the .NET space uh, called Xamarin, which allows you to write um, Android and iOS applications with a single code base. Wow. If you didn't use Xamarin, you'd have to use um, Java for Android and Swift for iOS. So that's two separate code bases, mm. two separate computer programming languages. It's doable, but if you make a change to both, you've got to go to two different code bases yeah. and change them both together. Um, whereas if you're able to use Xamarin, you can make it in one place, make one change, and it just it automatically builds for both. There's a lot more nuance than, in it than that, but it, that's sure. kind of like the simplified version. Yeah. And somebody said, why don't you, you know, it'd be great if you did an episode on Xamarin and talked about mobile phone development. And I was like, you know what? That's brilliant. You know, I hadn't thought of that because I don't do mobile phone development. But guess what? I'm going to learn too. And so I approached a whole bunch of people and said, look, I'd love to do a series on, on app development with Xamarin. I have no idea about it. So I am going to sound like I don't know what I'm talking about. Yeah. But would you be willing for me to sort of ask you those introductory questions? And everyone I approached was perfectly fine with it. They were like, yeah, no, not a problem. And then there are technologies like, uh, there's a technology called Blazor, which allows you to, so .NET stuff is usually run on the desktop computer or on a web server somewhere. Mm -hmm. Blazor allows you to run it inside of your web browser, which doesn't okay. sound like a big thing, but to us .NET develop developers, that's huge. Right. And so I was like, right, this, this is coming out. The Microsoft had just announced like a super early preview of it. Mm -hmm. And everyone was kind of playing with it and going, oh, this is interesting, but there's not really much going on. And my friend Chris was like, I am going to write a book on this. So I was like, Chris, <laughs> you, you, you and me, we need to talk. And would you mind talking on the podcast? And he's been on two times now. And I think he's going to be on a third time just to talk about like the evolution of the book because it's about to come out. And this thing was announced two years ago, right? So he's been working on it all that time. So I've, so I've reached out to him and said, look, I want to learn about this. And I'm sure people will want to learn about it too. So, and let's, you know, let's not beat about the bush. You can also talk to everyone who's listening about your book. Yeah. Right. And so win -win. that's how that happened. Yeah. Right. Everybody wins. You get some information. You get told about a book you can go get. You don't have to get the book, but you get the information anyway. Bonza, right? So that's what we did. Wow. And, and some of it has been, yeah, like I say, some of it has been listeners reaching out. Some of it has been the content creators themselves yeah. who are writing these books or whatever saying, hey, I'd love to be on the show because, uh, you know, we're talking about this technology or talking about that technology. Um, uh, you know, I don't know about yourself there, Matt, but I get loads of emails from all sorts of different people. And some of them are completely irrelevant right i get i got an email about a person oh this person was a ceo of this fortune 500 company and they're right. releasing this book and i'm like excellent that's i'm I, i'm genuinely happy to hear about that <laughs> but i then i then say to them right okay so without wanting to sound rude what is it that they bring to the listeners yeah who are specifically here to learn about this technology right mm. and and so those i have to turn down but yeah. a couple of people just sort of, uh, once every couple of weeks, someone will reach out and go, I've had this idea, right? I'm building this application or we did this thing at work today and I've been told that I could talk about it. Can I talk about it? 
there's a guy um, who was on recently who has written an application that lets you watch uh, independent pro wrestling video streams. Okay. Um, and and like niche he does a like a search change bit. Yeah, exactly. Right. <laughs> but he's getting like hundreds of hundreds of people logging in a day and paying him money to run the website. Right. Wow. And and okay. I was like, right, let's talk about it. Let's talk about not the content, but the way you built it because it's this Blazor stuff, right? And he was like, it's the first real world application that I know of that runs it. So I'm like, let's do this. Yeah. And not only was he able to talk about the the code and all that kind of stuff, but he also shared an architecture diagram so that you could see like a, an image of how he'd actually built it and all the different services that it used. And I think that's really useful for people, not just who are learning this Blazor stuff, but mm. also for like, how do I architect my application? How do I build it in blocks such that they are nice and neatly put together and so there's like these these bonus things that people get to learn if they if they are indeed if they want to go down the rabbit hole yeah Exactly, right? I mean, it could just be some VPN farm in China that's just boosting my numbers somehow. I don't know, right? <laughs> <laughs> but I love the fact that you're, um, you're very open to being new to a subject matter. You're not afraid to go near a subject matter. Um, I enjoyed the quote, I think it's in your trailer, if we don't have an opinion, we will make one up. And mm -hmm. I like the fact that you've, you've said that, but at the same time, with something as serious as technology can be, where do you sit in terms of taking the subject matter seriously, learning, and entertaining your audience? Sure. Um, so there's there's two podcasts that I create um, in that sort of technology space. Mm. Um, one is the .NET Core podcast, and that's really sort of more of a we do laugh and joke but it's like we have this goal of discussing this topic or technology or whatever we can laugh and joke if you want if that helps getting the information across that's not a problem and i feel very much like it comes across as a friendly conversation i do have a number of questions but it's more a case of all right let's uh, let's have a conversation right because mm. people don't want to in, in that particular niche people don't want to hear Okay, so what is the technology? The technology is this. Yeah. Great. How do I use the technology? You use the technology by doing this. Yeah. Nobody wants to hear that, right? Whereas I'm like, let's talk about it. Let's get into it. Let's talk about why you chose it and what's going on, right? Yeah. And the other show, Tabs and Spaces, is more sort of, it's less specific technology, but mm. it's more... Um, the, uh, myself and my co-hosts, Zach and James, just talking about um, we've collectively been in this business for about 40 years. Let's talk about some of the things we've experienced that other people may not have experienced or some of the things that we've experienced that juniors have not yet experienced and give them right. sort of like that leg up. We do, uh, I, I believe that's that's the the show that you got that quote from from mm, the trailer. If yeah, you don't yeah. have an opinion, we'll make one up. And we, we literally do. Um we, we make up some opinions on all sorts of stuff all the time. And that is much more of a, we, we literally sit around, have a few beers, and then we start recording, right? Cool. So we're nice and relaxed. Yeah. It's a bit more of a, uh, we, we try to make it more like a pub conversation. Mm -hmm. So like um, at programming conferences, which is a thing, just like I guess most other um, industries, Yeah, what you tend to do is people will go to these conferences, go to the talks, and then later that evening, they'll all go to the pub. Um, and then they'll just sit around in groups and say, oh man, I really wish I knew about this or the other, or yeah. you know, what is this object oriented thing? Well, let me tell you, right? Go get me a drink, buy me a beer and I'll tell you. <laughs> and then you sit there and you have a couple of beers and you have a laugh and a joke and then everybody's happy, right? Yeah. Everybody's learned something new because it's in this, this relaxed informal environment. And I feel like people learn better in, in, in that informal environment. And Tabs and Spaces is very much a... We'll talk about the topic at hand, but the main goal is to just have a laugh yeah. and present something that the listener can really just sort of kind of switch off. You don't really have to pay attention. You'll hear the jokes that we, we genuinely make up as we go along. And I really hope that people who <laughs> listen to it find it funny. Um, yeah. And we actually start every episode. We call it the Simpsons couch gag, right? Um, and so every episode starts with someone who's on the show just saying stuff like... Uh, what is it? Uh, I think uh, tabs and spaces where it's not legally binding or something like that. Yeah. Right? Just a really silly quip, right? Because that kind of gets you into the mood of this is not serious. Yes. We're being silly. Let's just abandon all seriousness as we go in, right? But I do feel as though because we have a, a Discord server for that one. Every time a new episode comes out, there's a flurry of comments about, oh my goodness, uh, 20 minutes in, Jamie said this and Zach said that or, you know... Um, 
whoever said this, here's a link that I think disproves that. And we're like, right, let's keep this conversation going because it's all about our opinions because that show is not a informative, it is more an opinion. Here's what yeah. I would do in that situation sort of thing. And do you think... Uh, so well, it's difficult do you have any, to balance. Yeah, well, I'm wondering if you have any uh, evidence of the those audiences cross-pollinating between the two podcasts and whether people will listen to both because they're... they're they both offer some of you, essentially, your brand that you've built there. You've got, you know, the smoking lounge and a non-smoking lounge almost. And it, it, when people could smoke in pubs, it was always more fun in the smoking lounge, right? Mm. But, and you, and you, even if you didn't smoke, you'd end up going into that side of the bar because that was where the fun was. But, the, the, yeah. you know, um, so I'm wondering if, if you see people come between the two audiences or how much that audience is shared in your opinion. Oh, totally. Um, there's a core group of people. So like, uh, so just to rewind a little bit, uh, mm. Zach, James and I all met because we were listening to a podcast called codingblocks.net. And oh, okay. uh, if, you're a, if you're a developer, I, if you're listening to this and you're a software developer, definitely recommend going and listening to their show because it is just three friends talking about some computer programming thing, right? Yeah. And it's if you listen to it and they listen to Tabs and Spaces, it's very similar, mm. except they're from the US and we're two of the three of us are from the UK. Yeah. Um, and we met because we all joined, they have like a Slack group for the fans of the show. And there's, I think, at last count, there's like four, 40,000 people in there or something. Wow. There's only okay. yeah, there's only about 200 of us who are active on a daily basis. Mm. But there's like people will sign up and then just not not join in or whatever. But yeah, that's fine. Yeah. You you do you, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um but yeah, there was a there's a core group of people on there who listen to coding blocks but also listen to tabs and spaces and listen to .net core and have been on on both of the shows that I'm involved in. So coding blocks don't do guest appearances, but I'm, right. I'm all about, hey, if you know something that I don't, yeah. come and tell me, come and teach me, right? I want yeah. to learn and I'm happy to be wrong. And so there is there, there is a crossover of about, I would say about um, 100 people who are listening to both um, .NET Core podcast and Tabs and Spaces That's only awesome. because the niche for Tabs and Spaces is bigger, right? It's mm. software development. Yeah. Whereas... The .NET Core podcast is software development in this very specific framework mm. and language and stuff. Right. So that makes your niche smaller, right? Yeah. But there are uh, uh, there are some crossover, and I see it because like someone will post a. I mean, I'm I'm active in all three like discords and slacks and stuff, mm. and I'll see we post a new tabs and spaces, and then before I've been able to tell everyone in coding blocks it's there, someone else has jumped in and gone, oh my goodness, there's a new tabs and spaces, and you know Jamie talks about this and Zach talks about that, and I'm like, wow, that's awesome, you're doing my work for me, that's brilliant. Yeah. <laughs> So before you started your podcast, did you give yourself um, sort of determinants for success? What would success look like for your podcast? Yeah, so success for me is somebody learning something at the end of the episode. That, that's all I care about. Mm. Um, you know, I mentioned the numbers earlier on just to get that part of the conversation out of the way. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> because, you know, invariably, if you get a bunch of podcasters together, um, for, for listeners who maybe aren't podcasters at the moment, um, there's this almost, sometimes when you get a bunch of podcasters together, they start to sort of brag about, oh, well, you know, I've had this person on the show or, mm. or I've had that person or, you know, uh, my friend Genevieve, um, her show has been listed in, I believe, The Times in, in the newspaper as like, this is the podcast to listen to if you want to learn about and then her niche. Wow. Right? Nice. And that's awesome. Right. Yeah. But uh, so her show is like celebrity catch up. So it's sure. like, what did that celebrity who's in, who was famous in the eighties or nineties? What are they doing now? Yeah. And how did that sort of fame change them? And uh, and and so success to me is not being included in the newspaper. Success to me is not the download numbers. Success to me is not sponsorships or anything like that. It's somebody learning something and going away and their life being changed, even if it's in that tiny way of going, oh, I know what Blazor is now, or, yeah. oh, I know that .NET is now cross-platform, whereas yeah. it used to be Windows, or, hey, I know what .NET is, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Just those tiny little things, that's success to me. Someone could take something from that. Um, because uh, an old girlfriend of mine, um, or rather an ex-girlfriend of mine, that's probably the best way to put it, um, <laughs> she's, <laughs> she's, she once said to me, that if someone buys her a book as a gift, 
doesn't matter what the what the subject matter is, if it's uh, factual, if it's fiction, whatever, she will read it because for the eight hours of effort, right, in Bunny Quants that she puts into reading it, yeah. she will learn one thing. She may not learn everything, but yeah. there'll be something that she can take away from that. And yeah. I, uh, when she told me that, I was like, Phew, even if she, she knows she doesn't outlook. like the author, she doesn't like the writing style, you know, she's still exactly, taking something yeah. away that builds their personality, their experience, their character trait. Yeah, Absolutely. I like that. So let's Absolutely. talk about the podcast itself. Um, I want to know what pre-production look like, looks like, what post-production looks like, and obviously the good stuff in the middle of production um, for both. So run me through your process. Okay, so uh, the process is slightly different for both shows. Okay. So don't, don't I call podcasts because it's more... Um, I would say a little bit more. I don't want to say that Tabs and Spaces isn't professional, but mm. like the 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 output is much more. Hey, you are here to learn. Let's learn a thing, right? Yeah. So curated, my goal is maybe. always exactly yeah curated. I like that. Um, so my goal is always to be um, uh, more um, open about that. And so mm. when somebody comes up to me and says, "Hey, can I be on the show?" I'm like, "Right, yep, absolutely." Let me take your email address. We'll sort that out. So it's mm. more, all of it is people coming to me. It's not, it's, or, or me going to them. It's not um, put up a web form and say, hey, everybody who wants to be on the show, you just click this link and anonymous, right? Yeah. I'm very much about building a relationship with someone first. Um, and what we'll do is we'll exchange a few emails um, and talk about the, the subject that they want to talk about. If it's a product that they want to talk about, I'm like, sure, but also, I want it to be 90% content. I don't want it to be 100% an ad for your thing, right? Right. Um, so, for instance, there was a, a company who wanted to come on and talk about, oh, we can make your code more secure and less bug prone. And I was like, okay, you could do that, but you've got five minutes to do that. I want the rest of the episode to be about what does bug prone code look like and yeah. how do people get around that, right? You could talk about your thing for five, 10 minutes, but most of it is going to be, let's talk about how to write good code or code that doesn't have bugs or whatever. Mm. Um, and so I set that expectation as early as possible. And then what I sometimes do is I'll have a discovery call. So mm -hmm. that could be Skype, it could be Zoom, it could be uh, Discord, it could be whatever, Google Hangouts, anything, right? Click the link, we'll have a chat. And we'll have like an, we're not recording, we're just talking, we're just getting to know each other. Mm. Okay, so you want to talk about this, brilliant, okay, yep. You've got some ideas flowing, brilliant. And then I go away and I create a Google document. Uh, so I've got G Drive for a whole bunch of my stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's Google Drive. And I've got like Google uh, documents and Google spreadsheets and stuff like that. Create a Google document that has a very specific format. And it's like, okay, so uh, here are some bullet points that I would like to talk about. You've said, let's use that debugging thing, right? Mm. So you want to talk about your product. Brilliant. You can mention that here. But let's talk about what is a bug. How do we debug programs? How mm. do we take bugs out of programs? How do we make sure that programs don't have bugs in, in the first place? Is it even possible to do that? And we go around this loop of, I'll write a whole bunch of bullet points and expand on them. And then I share that document with them. And I say, please, these are just suggestions. Mm. Feel free to add or remove anything you want. And so there's a couple of days, maybe a week of just the pair of us every so often, a couple of minutes at a time, jump in, make some changes. And then when it comes to actual production, we, we jump into the the system that I use. Mm -hmm. I have I have multiple monitors, so I've got like the the notes on one screen and them on another. We're doing the talky talky talky. Mm -hmm. I refer back to the notes. But what I say to them is this conversation can go anywhere. Right. So if you say something that I'm supremely interested in, yeah, I'll go, right, you've just mentioned that. Let's go in this completely weird direction that we haven't planned out and let's see where that takes us. Because I want yeah. to know, you know, you let's say you've mentioned um, you know, uh so you're you know, you've mentioned, well, you know, I want to work with audio in my programs. Right. Okay, so what does that mean? What do I need yeah. to learn to work with audio, right? So let's go in that direction. But we're still talking about debugging. We'll circle back around to it. It's more of a, like a free-flowing conversation rather than, like I said earlier, what is the program? The program yeah. is the thing. Really, you know, that it feels sometimes, especially in programming, that could feel quite dry. Yeah, But I course. feel like if you go around the houses and have that free-flowing conversation, then that feels a little less... Uh, daunting to the listener because then you've got more chances for that serendipitous knowledge drop, right? Yeah. If you if you go around the houses and and talk around the subject rather deep deep dive into it, I feel and like then, you've represented the audience quite well 
up to this point. You, you've you've acted on their behalf, not your own, which is um, I think a key point yeah. there. Yeah, that, that's that's my goal when I do that. Is mm. uh, you know, um, in the in the very early versions of the notes that I used to send over, it used to be I represent the audience and I'm going to ask the silly questions. Yeah, because we're going to pretend that I don't know, right? And that's my goal. Um, and then once production is wrapped, I then uh, so I don't do an intro and outro when we're recording. I then sit and think about what did we just talk about whilst it's still fresh in my mind. Mm-hmm. I write an intro and outro and record those separately, just like I throw up Audacity or whatever, record those. Um, and then when I bundle all of that audio, throw it over the wall to my editor and say, good luck, fella. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then he comes back a couple of days later, maybe a week later, depending on his schedule, because he's got lots of other clients to work with. Mm-hmm. He comes back with a rough cut and I'm like, this sounds awesome. It doesn't have the intro music or any bumpers or anything like that. It's just okay. my intro, the conversation, my outro. Mm-hmm. And then what I do, because of the because of the work that is involved in development, I then send that over to the person. And I'm like, look, right? Oh, do you? Okay. On the off chance, and it's only because on the off chance, if you've said something you're not allowed to say, yeah, I won't know. So can you have a listen to it? Just give me a bunch of timestamps. You don't even have to say what it is, just a bunch of timestamps, just in case you've said something that puts you like, that voids an NDA that you're working on, or you've mentioned a client, or you've mentioned like something that's coming up you're not sure about. So then they can, they then have uh, a whole two week block of getting a chance to listen to it or passing it on to legal if they work for a big company, that kind of thing. And then getting clearance for what they've said. If at that point, there's no edits. Fantastic. I'll tell the editor, right, it's ready, put the intro and outro on it properly. Give me an MP3, we're good to go. Cool. Um, but if if they don't, if they say, right, here's a bunch of edits need to be done, not a problem. I'll I'll give those to the editor. They can make a make an edit, but they only have that one chance, right? They, right. You've got this one block of because otherwise we'll go back and forth forever and we'll never release it, right? <laughs> yeah. But I also have the open caveat of Play it to legal, and if legal want to put the kibosh on it and say, you're not allowed to talk about this, what are you doing? I will totally respect that, and it will just never get released. And what we've talked about will never leave that recording, right? Yeah. You know, the the editor has heard it as well. I've heard it, but the editor is not a programmer. They know nothing about the, the, yeah. the whole industry. And, you know, I hope that I've shown that you can trust me with yeah. what we've done. And if, you're, if your legal team want me to sign something that says, I won't tell anyone, I am happy to do that. That way, no one's stressed. No one gets worried. Have you had any no of those? No one gets fired. I have actually had one. Um, and okay. it's the reason why I do this. Yeah, um, yeah. And it was really early on. It was a gent who at the time was leaving Microsoft. And he was like, yeah, so let's talk about the tools that they use. Because um, <laughs> because this whole thing is open source and you can you can actually go to a website and download the code yourself yeah. or submit patches yourself, you have to go through the process that they go through. So they give mm. you a bunch of tools to install and run that you then use to make your changes. Right. And he's like, the tools are open source and free and you can go grab those. The process is all documented. You can go follow that. And then he said, let me tell you what Microsoft are going to do for the next six months. Right. And that's what got him in trouble. Because because he was leaving, he wasn't, you know, he, he has that privilege of knowing what their plan was going to be. <laughs> of course. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You can't release so that, that information. Exactly. I didn't yeah. know that that wasn't public information at the time. Mm. So I put the episode out and I'm like, fantastic, not a problem. Oh, you a couple did. of it days live, later, after right. It, yeah, right. A couple of days after it drops, I get this hurried email from him saying, um, can we do an edit because I've just gotten into trouble. <laughs> you know, he got Jeez. the letter yeah. from the lawyers that said, you know, you've voided this, that and the other. So I was like, you know what, dude, I'm going to do everything in my power to help. So yeah. we went through and I snipped it down and, and was ready to push fire on a, on a, on a, a sort of edited version with, with those parts redacted. Mm. And then I said, actually... Let me check, and please obviously check yourself. But I think two weeks ago, or rather two weeks prior to our episode dropping, mm. someone else on the, on the at Microsoft was on another show and said exactly what you said. Oh, right? really? Okay. So if he's had clearance to say it, yeah. you may also have clearance to say it. Let me go find you a timestamp. So I went and grabbed the episode, yeah. grabbed the timestamp, and I said, look, 
I'm not saying, you know, be uh, nasty to them or anything, but send this over and say, look, this is on an episode of this other yeah, show. It's, it's this time. Yeah. It's exactly, right? Mm. And he was like, yep, I'll send that over to, the, to their lawyer team. And immediately, it was, as far as I'm aware, it was dropped. So I wow. never had to release the, the redacted version. Okay. But obviously, all that stress, nobody wants that stress, right? Yes. No, well, no. And so that's why I do that now. But in order to do that, I have to record way in advance, right? Yeah. I mentioned earlier on um, that at the time of recording, we're about to release, I think, episode 93. Okay. But I've already got 99 in the can. So because, six or seven and, ahead. Yeah, right. Because then there's that. And we release every two weeks, right? So I've got, you know, two or three months of, of leeway time for someone to say, actually, that whole section needs to be removed. And so mm. they've got that two or three weeks to actually feed back to managers, legal, whoever, so that they could check that what they've said isn't, you know, against any kind of yeah. anything. Exactly, yeah. right? Do you use guest release forms at all? Do you have that process in place? So I don't. But mm. I do mention in the in the uh, in the planning document that I'm going to leave them to do their due diligence, okay, to figure out whatever it is that that they should, and that's why I give them that that early release, right? Yeah. Um, what I want to do is lower the barrier to entry for people coming on the show, so that they're not afraid of doing it. Yeah. But then I also, as soon as we've stopped recording, I'm like, right, you will get a version of this in a week's time. And I, w I would like you to listen through to it and send it on to legal or whoever to mm. make sure you haven't said anything. And so yeah. I put the onus completely on them. Do you put a um, timeline on that cutoff point? So we've edited an episode, you've sent it over to them, that took seven days. Do you give them 14, 21 days? How long can someone indefinitely hold your content um, in sort of limbo? So um, I give them, it's almost like a gentleman's agreement. I, I hate mm. that phrase because it's so gendered, but <laughs> yeah. it's like a friendly agreement, right? Yeah. Um, if, I hear, if I don't hear back from you within two weeks, I'm going to assume everything's fine and I'm going to release it. Okay, um, if cool. I do hear back from you, then you know we'll do whatever changes you need. Or if I hear back from you and it's all good, then it will go out. Nothing That's wrong. no problem. Right? Yeah, awesome. Um, because the, and it's all done over email as well. So then I can say if something was to bounce back, I can say, look, here are all of the emails to whomever. Mm. Right? If legal come chasing after me, I'm like, look, I told them a month ago we were going to release this. Gave them two weeks to. It's not as it's not the same as a contract, no. but there is some kind of precedent there, right? It's like, yeah. hey, I've told them, and they didn't. You know, it's it's all on them at that point. Um, yeah. Well, I think then, that's a, quite a common thing with podcast guests that I've learned. Mm -hmm. I've been doing podcast, I've been launching podcasts since 2016. Um, mm -hmm. And it's really common, especially in the expert field or more sort of B2B podcasting, that the guests will come on, they're not podcasters, they're just industry experts. And they have not too much interest in the content beyond the recording itself. They don't really share mm -hmm. is a typical thing with expert professionals. So there is that point where they might just ghost you. Uh, so yeah, it's interesting mm -hmm. that you you kind of make that make them aware that I would I'm going to launch this. You've got your window of opportunity. Mm -hmm. And um, when when we're planning out the episode, for, and and even before we start planning out the episode, I'll say right, we have a gap of time. Um, mm. If we do this, it will be released on this day. So yeah. even before we started planning it, I've got a release date in mind. You know, this is Good, the, right. uh, I release on a Friday. So this is the Friday at 7.30 a.m. UK time when yep. the episode drops. Yeah. Um, assuming that we were recording it in the next week or so. So then there was already, I hate the phrase, but a ticking time bomb, right? You've already got that <laughs> deadline. <laughs> Deadlines need to be set, I think, uh, especially when it comes to delivering content uh, because it's our own content especially podcasting there are no rules you don't have to launch on a Friday at 7.30 in the morning mm -hmm. you can launch whenever you want your shows can be three hours long they can be three minutes long uh, and they can be as sporadic as you like so because there are no rules it's incredibly easy to create this sort of transient approach to creating content and I think it's really important that people do have a deadline and they say right I am going to do this by this point so mm. when it terms, uh, in terms of batching your content, how far ahead do you like to be? At the moment, you're about seven. Is that average? 
Yeah, that's, that sounds about right. Um, because what I do is obviously it takes some time to edit them too, and then I sit there. So I use uh, Libsyn for hosting. I'm not. Mm -hmm. I'm not trying to say use Libsyn. I'm just trying to say that's who I use. I yeah. kind of have to mention that just because what I say is I what I do is I go into the the dashboard that they provide and I'm looking at it and I'm like, okay, currently. I have a gap of there are three episodes already scheduled for release. That means if everything goes wobbly, I've got six weeks to recover from that. Yeah. Right? I've got this six week if I get ill, if I break a leg, if... A holiday. You know, exactly. Or yeah. indeed, um, what actually happened this time last year, my office flooded and I lost a bunch of oh, no. hardware. Right. right. Um, and... and that, but because I had that six-week gap, I didn't have to worry about it. I could focus on what's happening. If one of the kids gets sick, I can focus on mm. that. Well, like you say, if I want to go on a holiday, if there is, and I hate to say it, if there's some tragedy in the family, I can deal with that and not have to do, and not yeah, feel you, like I have to do You don't need thing, to right? be spending your sort of emotional resources on a podcast when something like that happens. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. So when it comes to publishing your podcast, you publish on Libsyn. Um, do you have sort of a promotional schedule? Do you pre-promote episodes? How do you tell the world about your podcasts? So it's different for... Um, so, so I actually, I produce three shows. This is like... Um, wait, are you say three? Now it's four, yeah, now yeah, it's it five. Like, yeah, How many my shows toast is got, happening right? there. This podcast yeah, is exactly. splitting into two. Yeah, right. Absolutely. But no, I, so um, for, for the two main shows i hate to say that right because I, I host the other one with my, with my brother i feel like he's going to say what my effort isn't worth spit yeah and that's they're all yeah, part of the network it's okay absolutely yeah. absolutely for um for one of the shows what we do uh, so for tabs and spaces mm. is the co-host and creator zach sits with the episode once it's been edited and and previously he'd spent two three hours cutting it down to a minute and a half and create like an audiogram and then release that a, a week early and then mm. we all sort of strategically start talking about it and sharing different clips and different bits cool. um, but we're actually taking a really hands-off approach because that takes three hours of his time to create it and yes. then we've got to schedule tweets linkedin statuses facebook statuses instagram yeah, blah, yeah. Blah, blah. so like it, it, <laughs> It's way too much effort, is what we're saying. It's, it is totally worth it. It's way too much effort. Whereas, you know, we're recording a pub chat, right? We're sitting around getting drunk and talking about nonsense. So yeah. let's treat it like it's that. Yep. Um, and for, so for, but that's different to how I do .NET Core podcast. Okay. The way I do that one is, firstly, all of the show notes, uh, all of the image artwork for an individual episode mm. has the person's picture on it. Nice. Very good. And that is... That is, it, it feeds into the ego, right? Some like if I'm on a show and I see my picture show up on on Twitter, I'm gonna be like, "Hey, that's me!" Retweet. It's super easy. It's almost, yeah. it's almost no value because all that is is just a retweet. You know, people just mm. scrolling through Twitter, they they'll see it, but they may not click on it, right? Mm. But then there's um, uh, uh, my friend again, my friend Genevieve. Um, told me the what uh, taught me this thing because she used to be a journalist. She was like, "What you do is you send them a carefully crafted email with here are all of the links to anywhere you may need to to link to should you want to link to. Yeah. Here's all the art assets. Here is you know some, I've even written a copy for you if you want if you just yeah, want to yeah. copy paste it. I do it the super same. Super easy for them. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Right. A media because then. That's it. That's it. Because then if somebody wants to then, if uh, I, like for instance, if you're interviewing me now, if mm. you wanted to do that, I could be like, well, I could sit here and, and I could think about what we talked about. I could listen mm. to the episode. I've got to listen to it anyway because I, I love listening to podcasts. hate my voice, but I love listening to podcasts. <laughs> I'm sure I'm saying something now that I will learn again when I'm listening. But yeah. I don't have to listen to then promote it right if, mm. if all i want to do is send out a tweet i can copy the content you've sent me and just paste it it's, it's not going to be in my voice but no. the job is already done right make it it's as easy as possible right yeah right that's it and that's all i'm that's what i'm about it's, it's all about making it as easy as possible mm. um and you know I, I used to i used to sort of share on reddit and uh, mm -hmm. places like that but the problem with with sharing on reddit is you have to provide value um and so yeah. what i do with 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 a lot of social spaces is i find 
the group of people that I, uh, again, it goes back to that uh, who, right? We talked about mm. the why, we talked about the who. You figure out the who, you can find out where they live, where not where they live, where they no, hang no, out yeah, online. I, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, you know what I mean? Hobbies, <laughs> I know what right? you mean. They're hanging, yeah. Out on, yeah. they're hanging out on Reddit, they're in these specific subreddits. Yeah. So for instance, the third show I do, video games, right? Mm-hmm. I'm a huge fan of Terry Pratchett's Discworld novels. Okay, cool. I really yeah. like the video games that were produced for them. I uh, In 2018, I tracked down the creator and director of the video games that were based on them, Greg Barnett. And I, I interviewed him. He was very gracious, gave me an hour and a half of his time. We talked about his career. We talked mm. about the games. We talked about what he's doing now. talked about advice he'd give to people who want to get into gaming. Awesome. And I bundled that up in an episode. And then what I do is occasionally... When, when the games come up on the Discworld subreddit, I'm like, I'll jump in and talk about what I love about the games. And then at the end, at the end of the post, I'll say, also, if folks are interested, I interviewed the guy who made them and leave it at yeah. that. I don't yeah. link to it. I just say, here's a bunch of value. And if you're interested, I can link to it. Yeah. And then invariably, I get people jumping in saying, hey, that would be awesome. Can you link to it? And yeah. then I'll like I'll go back later, maybe a, a couple of days later, and edit and say, you know, here's an edit from the future. A bunch of people were interested in seeing this. Here's the link, right? Because you're not self-promoting. All your ninety percent of what you've done is here is some value. Here is mm. loads of value, loads of value, loads of value, which is what people want. And then yeah. also, if you're interested, here's a thing, right? Um, because you can just shotgun blast out to the world. Here is a link to my thing. Here is an image. But you're not providing value. You're just providing a link and an image. And well, it's context people, as well, I think, isn't it? Yeah. It's, um, it's enjoying, enjoying the discussion and the discord yeah. and being able to integrate into that seamlessly is always going to create... It, I think it creates automatic consent from the people you're engaging mm -hmm. with for you to continue to share what you have as opposed yep. to the billboard approach of, I don't care who sees this as long as they see it. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Um, so what does the, think, go back to the .NET for quickly. Yeah. Um, what does, what kind of, how many assets are you sharing with people? I'm always interested to see, because you said it was quite a lot of work for the Tabs and Spaces podcast to mm -hmm. create a load of stuff to send out when really that's not the brand. Your other podcasts, how many digital assets or, or images are, are you sharing with people? Yeah, so I have, uh, essentially I just have the two images. I've got mm -hmm. the um, the episode level artwork, which is a square image. Um, for folks who don't know or folks who are getting into podcasting, it needs to be exactly square. Mm. One pixel out and you know good, right? Apple won't take it. And if Apple don't take it, nobody else takes it because everybody yeah. takes it from Apple, right? So it has to be exactly square. So that's, you know, um, guest on the left, the avatar for the show, not even me, I'm not on there. Guest, okay. for, a guest on the left, avatar for the show on the right, episode number along the top and a rough title down the bottom. So like it'll be the .NET Core Podcast episode 92, a picture of the guest who was Ponima Nayar, um, the avatar for the show, which is a little robot, purple robot holding a microphone. Cool. Um, and then it says Ponima Nayar, Blazer, GraphQL, Umbraco Hardcore. Right? Nice. So then it's the title of the episode, the person's name, the person's image. It's not me. It's got nothing to do with me. I don't want, I don't want me on there because on the, it's not me who who is the target audience mm. um and then i have like a widescreen image which okay. i use primarily for the website and the episodes go up to youtube and mm -hmm. and the podcast host that i use um they 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 will create that for me if i give them a, a 90 20 by 1080 image mm -hmm. and that is the same image but without any of the text so it's like a nice uh, sort of grayish background. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of developers like dark uh, themes on the, on their views. It's easier on our eyes. If you're sitting staring at a screen for eight hours a day, it's easier to have like a dark screen. Yeah. And so it's got a dark, nice dark background. Again, the uh, the person who's on the show on the left and the avatar for the show on the right, and that's it. Right. Awesome. Just it's simple, minimalist. Just that's what it is. You everything you need to know is in that image. If it's more. Excuse me, I just bashed the, the desk. I'll try that again. If it's more than one person, then mm. it's guest number one on the left, guest number one on the right, and the avatar for the show in the middle. Just because it's got nothing to do with me, it's these yeah. two people talking to this, to about this this robot, this about yeah. this thing, right? Um, 
And I, so I send sense. them those two. I send them a bunch of text. I send them, um, you know, we're going to be uh, promoting it uh, on Twitter uh, at this, uh, you know, on this account if you're interested. Mm. I also do it on uh, LinkedIn as well. Uh, so I'll connect with them on LinkedIn. But yeah. what I'll do is I'll connect with them on LinkedIn before we even record. I'm like, just as a courtesy, just because, you know, we're both awesome. I'd like to connect with you anyway. <laughs> a, that imp- that increases the number of people I'm connected with. And yeah. they're all pretty nice people because they're all interested in what I'm interested. Yeah, of and course. B, I can then, when I promote it on LinkedIn, hit the at symbol, type yeah. their name in, they're Tag automatically them. tagged in. They don't need to do anything. They just yeah. need to sort of, if they have privacy settings, they they may need to accept that I'm tagging them in something. Yeah. But most people are, are okay with that anyway. So that's that's sort of a free for them. They don't have to do anything. Mm. And then it, um, I'll let them know that the, the show notes have a transcription, mm-hmm. but the transcription is machine-based. So it's, it's yep. like a, a throw it up to... Uh, rev. Yeah, yeah, something like that, yeah. Um, and I, I will let them know that um, you know, the transcript won't be brilliant, um, but I go through and I listen to the first 10 minutes and the last 10 minutes and fix the transcription for those bits. And then I put a link in the show notes. Hey, this is a machine because, you know, a machine has done this because I don't have all the time in the world and all the yeah. money in the world because <laughs> I'm doing this for you for free. Mm. If you would like to fix this, click this link, fix it. And then as soon as they hit that fix button, it then rebuilds that page and puts their name at the top of the page. This page was, you know, this person helped to to fix this page. Wow. Um, That's incredible. There is a human in the loop so that yeah. we can sort of just to, to, so that somebody doesn't go fix this and then type in a bunch of political stuff or yeah. type in a bunch <laughs> of swear words or whatever. So there yeah. is that human step in the loop. So it's not immediate. It's usually mm. within a couple of hours. But that helps with um, reducing my workload, but yeah. also helping... You know, if some because like that's on that's on a website called uh, GitHub, and so that is a website used by developers. So then, if yeah. they want to increase their open source contributions to software, it technically counts as software. So then they can list that in their huh. portfolio and help them get a job as well. Yeah, right? nice. So it's all about helping people, right? It helps it's all me, about, but it helps, it helps them. Circles too. background to helping people, and that's I think I want to right? touch on that before we wrap up about. Um, mm-hmm. How, your engagement, you've listed Slack, you've listed social media platforms, Discord is a big one. How much time and effort do you put into engaging your audiences, three audiences? There's not a fourth here, right? Yeah, there's, there's, there's just three. Just the three, <laughs> still three. There's three just, audiences we right? worry about. Just, just, just yeah, three. Yeah. <laughs> I've got one podcast, um, you've got three. So yeah, how yeah, much time yeah. do you put into engaging your audiences? So that one's hard for me to quantify, um, mm. uh, just because. Uh, so I've got Twitter on my phone, I've got Slack on my phone, and it's signed yeah. up to all the different accounts, and I can flick for, through them. So like, if I'm waiting in line at the coffee shop, I'd be like, you know what? Let's see what's happening on Twitter. And I'm not there to post links to the show. I have no. Hootsuite, which will do that for me. Sure, um, but I, you know, I, I make a point. You know, if people see it, they know it's a, it's an automatic post. But I'm actually engaging. I'm, I'm looking through and I'm going, oh, cool! Here's this wonderful post about this. Or um, uh, there was a there was a podcast I listened to today called the O Wasp podcast. That's the Open Web Application Security Project, which is right. all about making. Uh, code more secure to make applications more secure which means that people have greater confidence in using web-based tools yeah they had a they had an episode about this particular technique and i was like this is really good i'm listening to it now get the Mm. link jump onto twitter i've just heard this great episode of this podcast and here are my key takeaways from it right Mm. so again i i'm not about i'm not spamming with links i'm like here that here is me trying to provide value Mm. and that's all i care about i want to provide value there are people who reach out to me and say is it worth me trying out this technology is it worth trying this is it worth trying that and i'm like do you know what it might be. Let's have a look. And so yeah. I will. I will like. I'll provide my opinion that I hope provides value. I mean, it's my opinion, right? It's probably worth course, nothing. Yeah. But, you know, I will say, look. In my opinion, here are the pros. Here are the cons. Yeah. Um, I would maybe take a look at it. Maybe build something in your own time. Mm. And uh, and that's across two or three different um, two or three different accounts across two or three different apps. Like yeah. you say, right? It balloons up. It's not just one Twitter account. It's three Twitter accounts. Yeah, three Twitter accounts, um, three uh, two Slack groups, one Discord, uh, Reddit, Facebook, Twitter, 
uh, LinkedIn, a whole bunch of different places. And it yeah. is mainly when I have a thought or when I see some other content that's got nothing to do with my content, mm. I'll jump on and go, hey, you know, I'll think, right, who is this for? Is this a video game thing? That's for Waffle and Taylors. Is this a Tabs and Spaces thing? That's for Tabs and Spaces. Yeah. Is this a .NET specific thing? Right, .NET. Jump in there. I've just heard this thing. I've just seen this blog post. I've just watched this video. I think it's pretty cool. And here are my key takeaways. Boom. Because yeah. then, you know, it's it's targeted to that group of people. And it's not, it's not me saying, listen to my show, listen to my show, listen to my show. It's all, these are other content creators doing amazing things. And you could tell I've paid attention to it because here are my takeaways, right? Yeah, because I'm really mean, authentic. That, yeah, right. That could easily just become someone's paid me five bucks to tweet something, you know, yeah, but it's not. It's yep. me continually trying to learn because I'm all about continual learning. In development, I say this to my uh, mentees and it scares them, but I say, <laughs> in development, the second that you stop learning, you're already two weeks behind. Yeah. And I don't mean learning something on an incredibly deeply technical level. Just knowing that something exists counts yeah. as learning. Yeah, because sure. then you can go to someone and say, so I've heard about this thing. I haven't tried it, but I think it'll help us build whatever we're building. Mm. Or I've heard about this thing. Have you tried it? Brilliant. Tell me all about it. Right. And and the second that you stop learning, you fall behind. And so I'm always like, I think yeah. I've got 133 subscribed podcasts on my on my app. Uh, like I've gone all in. I hardly yeah. ever listen to music or anything like that. It's like No, you just stop, I, don't I'm, you sometimes? Yeah, yeah. I, I'm one of the lucky ones who can listen to a podcast uh, that is a conversation about something and do the work at the same time. Uh, my friend Paul makes fun of me because I always say I'm an auditory learner, and I am. I, yeah. I learn best by listening. So I can, I won't get it 100%, but I could take about 60% of what's being, the core of what's being said, the point of what's being said mm. in, and still work at the same time. Yeah. So I do that. You know, I'm sitting there working, I'm typing out, I'm doing some code, and then I'll stop and go, wait, what did they just say? That just changed my world. <laughs> Let's go back. back. 30 seconds. Yeah, right. Just right. spin it back a couple of seconds and say, right, that was great. And yeah. then if they have a transcription, I'll jump to the transcription and read it and be like, yep, brilliant. Copy onto Twitter, onto LinkedIn, onto wherever. Yeah. This is awesome. And this person just said this, send. Because then it's like, it's like echoing that. I mean, yeah. I don't have a huge audience. I, I keep saying to myself, I don't have a huge audience, and I really don't, you know. Um, but for those people who are uh, sort of switched on to that, that may spark an idea. It might change yeah. their thought they process, matter. and that's what I'm about. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the power of podcasting. I think it's so accessible. You can be doing two things at once. You can listen back. You can repeat things. You know, it's not like a live mm -hmm. stream. It's not, you, you don't drive and watch videos, guys, you know. And a blog can be all and consuming for some people because reading just taxes massively. I think we read less and less. Well, as a coder, you guys are reading all day long, I guess. <laughs> um, so I'd love to start to wrap up the show if that's all right with my sort of ritual questions. Sure. The first one being, what was the most difficult thing about starting a podcast? Uh, I guess for me, it was just just starting. Um, I, I feel like I've got a very analytical and logical thought process. Mm. And so starting, the Don't Know podcast came first. And that was, I took the, the laptop, sat at the coffee shop and wrote out the first 16 episodes. And I like not bullet points, the whole thing, right? Wow. I was like, if I want to do this, I need to have at least 16 individual ideas. Right. Um, because pod fading is a thing, um, and it's usually around episode 21 to 26, and I figured if I can get 16 out now, or rather mm. 16 planned now and written now, then that gives me the time to come up with the next 10 to get past that pod fading step. So I think that it's was the now. hardest... Oh well, there you go then. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think eight is the is the the the, the data saying yeah, uh, if you get past eight, you're doing better than most podcasts. So, oh, brilliant! Yeah. Oh, that's good. I, I like that because then that, again, that's lowering the barrier to entry, right? Yeah. I love that, but it's it's finding those eight, right? Um, mm. And because I'm because I come from that teaching background where, you know, if you've, ever, if you've ever taught in a school, you have to have a teaching plan. You can't just go in and go, right, today we're going to learn about this. <laughs> you have to have it all planned out because you have yeah. to teach your curriculum, right? Yeah. So you need to say, right, by the end of the year, we need to know these things. In order to get to that point, we've got maybe 26 lessons, right? That's it. That, that, 
that's pretty much it. So in those 26 lessons, we need to spend four on this topic, four on that topic. And so mm. because I came from that background, I was like, right, if I want to, by the end of 16 episodes, have the listeners who have stuck around mm. get to know these things, these are the 16 things they need to learn. This is how I'm going to teach them, or this is how I'm going to try and impart that knowledge. Yeah. And, and by doing that, because the show is very, it's very niche. I don't think you could do this with a comedy show or with a uh, actual play or anything like that. I don't think you could do that with those. Mm. You probably could with an actual play because you kind of have a story to tell. Right. And a story-based podcast, you would be able to. You'd be like, in season one, we're going to have this arc, much like you would do with a TV show, right? Yeah. But I think with a deeply technical one, you have this idea, or at least I had this idea of, by the end of year one, people will be knowing this or people who've stuck around will know this yeah. by the end of year t like the third time I'd gone to the coffee shop, I'd gotten like two years of monologues written. I've only ever released 16 of them. Right. Right. So that helps with sort of like the double whammy of if I'm ever down for time or people aren't yeah, able yeah. to come on the show, guess what? I've got all of these monologues banked. I can wow. just sit there and just record record all day and get them all done. And then that's a year, maybe a year's worth of content because the words are already there. I just got to read them. <laughs> and that is reverse engineering at its best, isn't it? Yeah. Yep. What is the outcome? Now I know where I need to get to. Let's get going. That's it. That's awesome. it. Because, because even though a journey of a thousand miles starts with a single step, mm. you need to know where that thousand miles is going to be. Yeah. You don't want to walk right. the wrong direction a thousand miles, do you? Exactly. Right. Two thousand exactly. miles to get back to where you, to where you need to be. Yeah. Yep. That's, That's it. awesome. Um, what podcasts <laughs> inspire you? Oh my goodness, I am all over the map. Um, <laughs> one of the ones I really like because of the way that they put things across is Radio Lab. Um, yes. they do. Um, for folks who haven't listened, they talk about uh, sort of sometimes scientific, sometimes economical, sometimes philosophical, loads of different to uh, topics. But they present them. I, I describe it as an audio essay. So they'll start talking and they'll be like, "Right, okay. So today we're going to talk about um, lobsters." There was this amazing one that they did with with lobsters and how they snap their. Uh, this was a number of years ago. This was one of the first ones, wasn't it? That was that there were yeah prawns at the bottom of a lake. That's a, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, yeah, where they can communicate by snapping their claws and causing yeah. minor explosions in the in the in the water. Yeah, and just like <laughs> and 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 you're thinking, what well, this is? I mean, it's great knowledge, but what's this got to do with anything? And yeah. you start listening, and then like they'll start stay, saying a sentence, and then to back up what they're saying, they splice in a scientist talking about this is what it is, and then they jump back to them in the studio, and then yeah. they're like, but it sounds like a mini explosion. Then boom, you get a clip of the audio, right? Yeah. 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 Of, of it have it actually happening and i really really love that because it's a really engaging way to talk and and teach something because you oh, can just yeah. you know you don't want to be ferris bueller's teacher today we're going to learn yeah. about the thing that we're going to learn about whereas constantly switching between audio sources and having an expert jump in then jump back out and then having audio clips and jump back out or having a siren and then jump back out it keeps the yeah. people engaged you're always like wait what was that what was that? Let's go back and just find out what that was, right? So yeah. I'm, I'm, I, I honestly feel like that type of almost like storytelling, that crafted storytelling, is really innovative. It's incredible because they get subject matters to people <laughs> that you would never consider listening to, especially the socio-political stuff or some of mm -hmm. the philosophical subject matters. You mm -hmm. wouldn't, if you saw that as a book or as you saw that as a video, you probably wouldn't come across it unless you were interested in that. But because they've created such a wonderful format, you just listen to it because you know it's going to be theatre of sound and that's mm -hmm. going to take you through even, it, even the most mundane subject matter comes across interesting i think yeah yeah i'm with you with that great stuff totally and there's there's another two that are very similar to that and that's twenty thousand mm -hmm. hertz and Dallas Taylor, 99 percent yeah. invisible because yep. those are just they're amazing um twenty thousand hertz is brilliant because it's like uh, i mean i'm sure you've i mean you just said then matt right you know who it is so yeah, i shared a stage with it well know. virtual stage yeah oh wow that's awesome <laughs> we both did we did Podfest. he was he was the keynote on the Podfest stage in 2020 or 2019. 2020, I think it was. But yeah. Oh, cool. That's awesome. 
Um, yeah. And yeah, for people who don't know, it's very much about like the the design of sounds, and so it's mm. very similar. It's like uh, there was a brilliant one recently about the HBO. Um, musical idents and how it started as like this big orchestral da 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 and now it's just like static with a oh behind it but it's not just an oh it's like there's 15 different musical instruments and a choir mm. and why they chose the note that they chose and why it's static going into that and why when you finish watching a show it's the reverse of that like the the sound going back into static and yeah. why it all works fantastic and 99% Invisible is about the things that you don't see but you 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 don't notice but you see every day right mm -hmm. the design of everyday things and i'm all about the design of everyday things yeah. there's a there's a wonderful book called the design of everyday things and it's all about why for instance ask questions about like it sounds silly me saying it but why is the spout on a teapot not on the same side as the handle mm. because you burn yourself but someone will have in the past <laughs> made a teapot with a spout on the same side as the handle how yeah. do we get from that idea to where we are now <laughs> and it's it's absolutely wonderful and, yeah. and like you say it's taking those subjects that you would think are mundane and just explaining where they come from, but in a really innovative format. Yeah. Um, so those are great. Um, and I really like uh, NPR's Pop Culture Happy Hour, mm -hmm. where it's like three or four people just sitting, they literally sit around a table and they discuss a thing, right? So they recently had, uh, they had a double whammy of The Fresh Prince of Bel-Air and Bel-Air. The right. two episodes back to back where they talked about here here is the the cultural I mean everybody everybody knows about or rather people of a certain vintage will know about <laughs> the cultural um, uh, hit of the Fresh Prince of Bel Air the mm. fact that you can play the theme tune to a room full of people and everyone knows the words right yeah because it was he was like a cultural staple. And they talked about the, the, their favorite episodes and how it changed TV and things like that. And then they did another episode later that was all about like the new show that, the, that they've made, which is more of a dramatic um, mm. reboot of it. It's not a sitcom. It's not anything. It's like more of a, what if this was real? What would yeah. it actually look like? And they go through that. And and that's really, I find that really uh, both entertaining and innovative as well, because it's it's three or four people just talking about, oh, well, and, and it's, it sounds really boring, but like they'll talk about books, they'll talk yeah. about music, uh, but they'll talk about one song or a chapter of a book. And it is so, I can't really get across because I don't have the vocabulary, just <laughs> how, how really well done it is. Yeah, right? yeah. So I'm constantly... You feel like you're part of it. Um, absolutely, yeah. Um, yeah. And I think that's partially down to the mixing. So mm. I know a, no, a number of podcasts do this where if they have three people on the show, they'll mix one person right in the center and then the other two people are mixed slightly off to the left and slightly off to the right. So yeah. if you're listening on a pair of headphones or a pair of speakers, it sounds like they're sitting around you, mm. which is just like wonderful. I mean, I don't produce stereo shows because I feel like that's a bit of a waste of bandwidth for yeah. the type of shows that I do. But for, the, mm. for their types of shows, that makes perfect sense because you don't realize, but you're being drawn into the conversation. Mm. And I just find that, I find it fascinating. I, I can't recreate any of it for any of my content, but I, no. I find that fascinating. And then when they talk about stuff, I'm like, wow. Uh, so like, um, let's, uh, when people talk about uh, economics, mm. well, what's that got to do with programming? Well, let me tell you. And then yeah, I'll think yeah. of a topic that is related to that, right? Because I'm all about yeah. using metaphors to get the idea across. Um, mm. And so I look for metaphors outside of my domain. My domain is computer programming. I look mm. for outside of it. So if somebody says to me, explain microservices, I'll say, well, imagine you're at a coffee shop. You go up to the, the, the counter and you buy the coffee, right? Mm -hmm. They don't give you it there and then. That's the service that takes your payment. And then you move along a queue mm. and then you see someone at the coffee bar making the coffees and eventually your coffee comes out. In order to, to make more coffees, they just build more coffee bars. They don't need to build more shops. Mm. They just build more bars mm. within the shop or they build more tills. And, and, it, and, and so to, to, to the uh, project managers and the clients that I work with, that makes sense to them because that's an yeah. idea that they can get behind. But yes. I wouldn't have thought of that if I didn't think of episodes of like Radio Lab or, or, yeah, or that, things like that, that where they talk about through. coffee shops. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, that's awesome. Uh, those, those four podcasts really speak to your curiosity and your mindset and you're continually wanting to hear new things 
it definitely it all ties together nicely. Uh, next one is what small change have you made that's made a huge impact on your content creation? Uh, I would say the small iterative changes of sort of every so often, maybe every couple of months, every six months, every year, check in with my hardware, right? Um, it sounds silly, but I've been involved in editing shows where um, during the recording, they're all recording uh, locally. So in podcasting, they sometimes call that a double ender. I mm. record my audio, you record yours. But I, I know I'm teaching you, teaching grandma how to suck eggs when I say this no, to you. No, no, it's Matt, all good. Obviously that, for, the, yeah. for the audience, right? They may not mm. know this. So in order to ensure that you get the highest possible quality, you can do a double ender. Everyone records mm. their local audio. You all send it to the editor. Um, I have been involved in editing a show, and I will not say who it is because I don't want to embarrass them, um, <laughs> where in the recording, um, one of them goes, oh, I've just run out of hard drive space. <laughs> So uh, we're going to have to we use stop? the low quality. Well, they didn't. Uh, they were like, no. well, we'll have to use the low quality recorder that we use just to get us all in the same room. Yeah. Um, and then when it came to, to editing it, I had one track to work with. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, you'll know yourself, Matt. I've just said I have one track to work with. You know the pain of that. Um, listeners, what you want is you want individual tracks isolated for each person. So my audio is being recorded as one track. Matt's is being recorded as another. That mm. way, if he needs to make changes to just my track, he doesn't have to make changes to his track, if that makes sense. If I bash yeah. the desk, he doesn't need to, whilst he's talking, he can mute my audio and carry on. He yeah. doesn't have to delete anything and re-record it later. Last year, so I had a, uh, a, a, someone that has a number one ranked podcasting show. Um, mm -hmm. They were a guest on someone else's show and 15 minutes into the recording, they said, oh, should I plug my mic in? <laughs> ah. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't producing. But yeah, it was like, oh, my mic's not even plugged in. Silly me. Uh, <laughs> but I didn't go back. So yeah, we had some wishy-washy wow. audio at the beginning of that. But um, yeah, keep an eye on your hardware. That's a, a great yeah, yeah. small change. What and advice think, would you give? Oh, sorry. sorry. I was just going to say, I think um, as part of that, not jump in and go, I need to buy $1,000 worth of microphone. You can, um, you know, a, 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 it's someone who's great at using their tools with mm. a really bad tool can make something wonderful. Someone mm. who's really bad at using the tools but with the world's best tool will make something not as good, right? You see yeah, this yeah. with, uh, you know, with, with uh, teenagers, when they get a guitar, they're like, I want to get the best guitar in the world. And I'm yeah, like, yeah, yeah, but you don't know any chords yet, right? <laughs> you don't know how to play anything. Getting the world's best guitar is not going to make you the world's best guitarist. Yeah. <laughs> and it's the same with podcasting equipment, cameras, microphones, whatever, um, and slowly iterate towards what you perceive as better stuff. Um, yeah. Because... You know, you could go out, I think I've had a chat with my friend Steve Worthy about this. Uh, we've both said to people, you could go out and spend $5,000 at Best Buy at wherever, on Amazon, whatever, mm. and buy loads of equipment and then get two episodes in and go, you know what, this isn't for me. And then you've got $5,000 worth of gear that you can't do anything with. You have yeah. to sell on and you're going to lose money on it, right? I have a coaching Whereas, client that spent three grand on the gear yeah. and we never recorded a single episode. Yep. He just it just he just decided in the end that he actually didn't really want to do it and the subject matter didn't warrant audio only and mm -hmm. yeah. So I said, What are you gonna do with all the gear? And I think it's just dusty in his spare room now. But um Oh no. <laughs> yeah. Um next question. What advice would you give to a new content creator or someone that's sitting on the fence wondering, should I start making my podcast? So I would never say don't do it. Um, okay. I would say take a look at, like try and find out exactly how much work it's going to be. Um, because a lot of people see the Joe Rogans, they see the Mr. Beards, they see these huge content creators and go, but I can make a million dollars and stick it in my ears and go <laughs> all day. But actually what you don't realize is, I mean, you were saying yourself there, right? You, you produce shows, right? There is a team for these big shows like Joe Rogan. There's a team of people that work with him. Someone mm. books the guest. Someone else writes the prompts for the conversation they're going to have. Someone else prepares the guest. Someone mm. else or a team of someone else's edits the shows and produces those little clips you see on YouTube and Twitter and things like that. It's not Joe Rogan. Joe Rogan turns up, reads the sponsorship ad, mm. and then 
starts talking and reads the cue cards. It looks like Joe Rogan's looking directly at the person. Mm. But when the camera cuts to the other person, if you're watching the video version, he's reading the cue card to get an idea of what he's going to say next. Yes. You know, there's, there's a, it's a huge machine. So don't get trapped in this idea of I can make loads of money overnight because you're kind of not going to. And I'm sorry to burst the bubble unless you have a big team behind you or, um, or you are incredibly niche. Like mm. if you create a podcast where it's me and my mates having loads of fun and talking about stuff, right? Who's, who, who's listening to it? What's your why? And mm. who is your who? Get those two sorted first. Then look at how much effort it's going to take to actually do it. And then really sit down and have a frank discussion about your own bandwidth. And I don't mean mm. internet bandwidth, the amount of time that you can dedicate to it out of your own physical time. You know, if you have kids, it might not be the best thing to do. If you have uh, people who are dependent on you, it might not be the best thing to do. It could mm. be something you could do in your own time to sort of give you that hobby, that outlet, that creative outlet but then be really frank and honest with yourself. If you're going to release an, a sh an episode of a show once every month, can you, and it sounds really easy, but can you dedicate a, a number of hours to producing mm. that show every month? Yeah. And if you can't, then, you know, maybe it's not for you, you know? I, I hate to say it like that, but maybe it isn't. No, right? that's great advice. I think, uh, yeah, be wary of what you're getting into. Uh, it just looks easy. People think you just start recording and it all falls into place. But there's a lot of nuances. There are a lot of people out there mm. like you and I that help people produce shows, get some advice. You can often get a lot of free advice. Um, but yeah, get as much advice as you can and really map out how long do you need for it. Mm -hmm. um, for you, what three values do you want to be known for through your content? So I think... Uh it's super easy to say this, but I guess honesty. Um, uh, <laughs> I feel like I'm going to sound like a pro wrestler. Honesty, integrity, and you know, like. <laughs> but yeah, definitely honesty, right? I, I mm. want to be honest with the people who are consuming this content. I want them to know that when I say I really don't know, but let's go on a journey and find out. I haven't pre-planned that. Mm. I'm literally like if I'm doing the coding streams, I pull up Google and I show it on screen. I am Googling for the thing. And then yeah. I'll sit and I'll read through it real quick and I'll be like, right, okay, this is the it's a huge page of content, but this is the thing we need. Right, okay, copy mm. that, put that in there, let's work this out together, let's plan this out. I have a um I have a uh it's called a remarkable tablet. It's one of these e ink tablets you can write on. Okay. And I yep. plug that into the computer and I can capture that as I'm going. So if I need to make notes, I switch to another scene and I can physically write on the tablet and it shows mm -hmm. up on screen. And so people can see me making notes as I'm going along, right? I need to remember this, we need to remember that. So right. I'm being on I'm trying to be honest with those that consume the content and say, I'm learning as much as you are. And if I don't know, then let's go find out. Or if you know and you're willing to teach me, let's do this. So sure. honesty has got to be one of them. Um, mm -hmm. And I guess um, I, I've not done a great job of it, but clarity. Um, mm -hmm. Definitely not done a great job of it during this interview because I feel like I've waffled on way too much. But like <laughs> getting to the point, when it's when it's a, a podcast that I'm in control of editing and producing, mm. any time that I sort of step over my words or flub or anything like that, those come out so then it sounds more like I'm going right okay I'm getting to the thrust of the conversation here mm -hmm. this is the point I want to ask you about this is the point I want to make yeah and I think um, uh, respect I think is one of them I okay. it, it, not respect for me but the respect that I have for anyone else right um, I've I've been doing this thing uh, not so much for the past few years because of the, the whole world going wobbly yeah. but before then um, at conferences you would find people standing around in a circle if mm. I join that circle, I turn slightly away from the circle to give a gap so someone else can join in. Right? Okay. And that's part of my thing saying, hey, come on in. You know, you, you, your, your, your ideas, your experience, your thoughts on this will be as respected as the person who has started this conversation. I'm giving you a gap. Come on in. I'm not doing this because I'm great and look at me. I'm like, no, come on, you could be part of this. Come on. Mm. And, um, there's someone who put me onto it. it, it he uses the phrase Pac-Man. You want to make the shape of a Pac-Man, not the shape of a, a circle. Imagine a pizza without a slice in it if you're not a video yeah. gamer, right? That's the shape you want to make. You want to leave a gap so someone can come in. And then yep. you all sort of shuffle a little bit to make another gap so someone else can come in. And I, 
I am uh, the way that I see it. If somebody wants to talk to me about something, I don't care where they're from. You know, I, I do, I do care, but it's not part of my. Oh my goodness, I'm not going to talk to you because you are X, whatever X is. Yeah. Whether it's uh, um, a race, a sexual orientation, an identity, anything like that, I'm like, you have chosen to talk to me. I am super interested. I mm-hmm. want to talk to you because I'm super interested in you. I respect you because you want to talk to me, right? Mm-hmm. Or, or I respect you because you have this knowledge and you have this experience. That's what I'm about. I'm not about. Oh well, I. I Right. I'm going to say something that's very controversial. Okay. I know a lot of developers who are male who will say, I don't want to talk to that person because they are a woman or because they are right. X or because they are Y. And I'm like, yep. you idiot, you're, you're missing out on a huge huge uh, swathe yeah, yeah. of knowledge, huge swathe of experience. Let this person into the conversation. And yeah. I'm all about providing in in whatever small space that i have providing that space for someone to come in and say i want to be part of this conversation yeah so why I'm limit yourself that much exactly exactly yeah. so i would hope that i could be known as someone who respects everyone else respects others and bringing them in right strong whether strong that pans out or not we don't know <laughs> honesty clarity and respect very nice. And my final question is, what do you think makes a good leader? So a good leader, um, I'm sure we've all seen this graphic online, right? Uh, of the boss and the leader, right? Mm. A huge uh, a group of people pulling something. The boss is sitting on the chair for the thing that they are pulling. Yeah. The leader is at the front of the queue pulling harder than everyone else. Mm-hmm. Right? The way I see it is a leader is someone who is um, who wants to boost the uh, skills and up the game of everyone else around them, right? So, I mean, I run a company, I have a number of employees, I want them to outshine me because it's not about me, it's about them, right? And so uh, my editor, I've brought up my editor a few times, he works for the company that I run. And Mm. I'm like, okay, dude, do you want to do any training? Do you want to take some time and learn some stuff if you want? I want you to be way better at this than me because you have the ability to do this. Mm. Can I buy you books? Can I buy you courses? Can I get you uh, some expert advice? Can I hook you up with somebody to sort of help Mm. you learn that? Because it's all about amplifying you. If you decide after six months, after a year to go work for someone else, I will be incredibly happy for you because you are following that destiny. You're following that journey of yourself. It's not up to me as a leader to tell you, you have to work for this company. You have to be earning this much money. You have to be doing this work. If I'm giving you too much work to do tell me and we'll Mm. we'll reorganize it i'll take some of it or we'll get another editor or we'll get less work to do it's all about it's all about fitting that person in there's a there's a book i've forgotten the name of the lady who's written it but it's called dare to to lead and that is it's all about the small the, it's it's the small things that make mm. someone better at being a leader. She talks about um, uh, trust, and trust is one of these things. She was she she shares this uh, story of her daughter when her daughter was six or seven. Um, she told her daughter had told her friend at school a secret, and she said, "This is my secret. This is my thing. Please don't tell anyone." And then, children being children, you yeah. know, they they don't quite know people the being people, etiquette yeah. and the rules exactly. Right before she knows it. Before the end of the day, the secret's out. It's all around school. She mm. comes home in tears. She says she's broken my trust. And and the, the author had said to her daughter, how do you visualize trust? And she said, trust is like a jar, right? It's a jar. Every time someone does something good for you, you put a coin in the jar. Every time they do something bad for you, you take the coin out of the jar. And I want everyone that I am in effect leading either by the content that I create or the employees that I have to feel like that jar is overflowing. My mm. goal is to make that jar overflow. And it's not up to it's not up to uh, to me to say, you need to trust me more. It's what can I do to help you to trust me more? What can I do to prove it to you? It's my job to do the actions which build up the trust. So what do I need to do to help you? And yeah. that's, that's, that's what I think a great leader is, someone who can sort of step back and say, what do we need to do to make you fulfill all of your potential? Because that's what it's all about. It's about potential. That's what I yeah. see potential in everybody. And I'm like, can I help you with this? And if I can't, can I find someone who can? Amazing. 
Jamie, that's been awesome. I really appreciate <laughs> you sharing your content creation experience with us. And yeah, you are definitely a podcasting leader. I uh, love <laughs> I love so much of what you said there. It's a real shining example of, you know, creating content with purpose, coming at things from a, what is the outcome? What do I want someone to gain from this as opposed to why am I doing it? Your, your why is the success of other people. And that's, mm -hmm. that's a great message, you know. It keeps you all warm and fuzzy inside. So thank you very much for sharing with me today, Jamie. Not a problem, Matt. Thank you very much for inviting me on the show. I've had, a, I've had an absolute blast. And I just hope that there's something I've said that will help one of your listeners. <laughs> Definitely. I guarantee it. Thank you.